Today we've got a great story of revenge against a religious fraternal group. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, dad tried to eat a gift I got from my then husband. My late dad had the thoughts that if something was in his house, it was his. He conveniently forgot that my mom is the one who bought the property and house. It was actually hers. Anyways, my then husband and I were living with them. Because hubby had lost his job due to his boss retiring, I was six months pregnant. Anyways, I bought a special jar that looked like it had gourmet jelly beans in it for my husband. I put it on the counter and told dad not to touch it, that it was a gift for my husband and that I would be right back to wrap it up. I went to get the supplies and had just come back into the kitchen with the needed supplies. I heard my dad mutter, it's my house. I didn't try to stop him as I put my supplies on the counter and just watched him. He smirked at me and should have realized something was very wrong. Mom, who was there drinking her coffee, smiled. She knew but kept her mouth shut. He opened the jar and his high-pitched, girly scream and the massive jump that caused him to fall on his butt had me laughing hard. I nearly collapsed to the floor. He was then holding onto his chest and breathing hard. A snake had just jumped out along with confetti. He glared at me and called me a bench, which just had me laughing harder. Mom told him, when she tells you not to touch something, you should know by now not to touch it. That it's meant to scare the crap out of someone, and this place is my house since I bought it with my money. I just let you live in it. I cleaned up everything and put it back in and wrapped it up. When hubby got home, he looked defeated. I gave him his gift. His eyes lit up and he eagerly opened it. I got another girly scream and then he started laughing. Then I gave him the other gift. I bought four bags of gourmet jelly beans. Since I know my parents love them just as much as my husband and me, I gave my parents each a bag, one for myself, and of course hubby. I wanted him to not be depressed that he couldn't find a job just yet. This helped enormously with his mood, but added to the happy atmosphere was the sudden bickering between my parents. Mom didn't think he deserved his bag and was demanding that he give it back. He was telling not to lay her filthy hands on his bag and actually hugging his bag to his chest and then growled at her. She gasped in mocked outrage. You did not just growl at me. She tried to snatch it from him and he took off running. She chased him. My husband and I found that funny, especially when my dad shouted, Woman, keep away from my dang bag! I was gasping for air and had tears running down my face and laughed harder when she started cussing him out in Spanish. She lied to dad and told him it was his Spanish endearment. Not a bad way to deal with somebody who is relentless in opening other people's things. I mean, how do you get it through to them? Either that or you buy some kind of adult entertainment toy and embarrass them enough to the point where they're like, Okay, you know what, maybe I should give them a little bit more privacy or respect their things more. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is returning fire on a kid with a pellet gun. When I was a kid, I did a paper round in a well-heeled neighborhood, and every day some rich little jerk would shoot at me with a pellet rifle from his bedroom window. He never actually hit me, but a couple of slugs ricocheted off my bike frame and spokes. I too had a pellet rifle and took it with me one day and returned fire, deliberately putting about 10 holes in his windows. Although young at the time, I reasoned that his parents would not discern that the shots had come from outside and assumed their little angel had done it. The assumption turned out to be correct. No more pot shots at me ever again. Honestly, I feel like this could go one of two ways. Either their parents could assume and honestly punish their own kid for ruining those windows. Or maybe the kid actually did realize they were getting return fire and maybe they want to stop doing that. This next story is, mechanic attempted to get over on me, ended up doing significant damage to my car. I'm getting the last laugh though. Yes, I'm out a few thousand, but I'm ruining the guy. Turns out he's unlicensed and from what I can deduce, he hasn't been paying taxes. On top of that, he's got an unlicensed junkyard and a few junk single-wide mobile homes on his property too. Because he's being a butt, I called and filled out forms with the health department and reported the trailers, the planning department, because he's got structures he built without permits, the EPA for leaking fluids, the State Department of Revenue, and reported fraud to the IRS. I know he's made at least $100,000 in the past three years, all untaxed. Yes, I know I'm petty as heck. Update, I just got a call from the planning department. They've opened three investigations. It turns out that he's within a thousand feet of critical wetlands, a critical aquifer recharge area, 
and a stream that has spawning salmon. So, considering OP's update, this guy is going to be destroyed. Honestly, they might not just get fines, this guy might get actual charges. Our next story is, take food not meant for you? Have fun with that. I was asked to cater a party for a friend. She requested fry bread tacos, egg rolls, bleeding cupcakes, two pans of baked pastas, and a tray of brandy marinated chocolate covered cherries. I was happy to do it, and the day before the party I did some prep work and made the cupcakes and started marinating the cherries. I got a phone call and stepped away from the kitchen for a few minutes while the cherries were draining, only to come back and find my grandma shoveling the cherries in her mouth like she was starving. She managed to cram nearly half a pound of them in her gob in like the 10 minutes it took me to take the call. I quickly grabbed the bowl and told her they were not meant for her and that she's about to have a really rough day because they'd been soaking in alcohol for the last 24 hours. She called me a liar and tried to grab more of them and I, knowing she's not supposed to have alcohol, just let her eat several more handfuls of brandy soaked cherries. 20 minutes later the effects began to happen and she could barely stay sitting upright. I finished the food and let my friend know I was going to be a bit short on the cherries because of my grandma and after 20 years of friendship she laughed and said it wasn't a problem. Went and catered the party, had a great time and stayed the night at my friend's place. When I came home the next day she had the worst hangover so I decided to blast Sabaton and shampoo carpets. Don't freaking take food, it isn't meant for you. My question is, why would they not believe that OP could possibly be soaking these cherries in alcohol? I firmly subscribe to the belief that when OP told them, they lied to themselves so they could keep shoveling cherries in their mouth. Our next story is, Thief stole my phone, now his friends get spam. A few days ago, my phone was stolen. However, since I live very far from my carrier's local store, didn't have a phone to call them from, and my phone is the primary internet at home. It took me a couple of days to get in touch with them. In the meantime, the thief removed my SIM from my phone and put it in his own phone, which he was using to sell drugs and stolen property. I went to my carrier and shut him down. I got the IMEI of my phone blacklisted as well as the one he put my SIM in. Then I logged into my carrier's account and looked at all the outgoing calls he placed. I found 13 different numbers he dialed. Now, all of his friends are signed up for SMS spam from the Republican Party, Democratic Party, and Libertarian Party, as well as numerous individual campaigns. Any other suggestions? Do the Scientologists send SMS spam? I think religious stuff might be really annoying. I would say try to sign them up for anything that suggests getting a loan, like banks, transunion, any kind of credit-related thing. If you can sign up with just a phone number, Maybe one of those, inquire to see if you can qualify for a loan and you can just put the number in initially. Those services would love to send text after text of, we think you could qualify for a loan, continue your application now. Our next story is, Facebook marketplace seller scammed a family member. So a family member was scammed for concert tickets for a well-known musician recently. They gave a bank account which they sent money to and bam, blocked. They were 60 British pounds down and the bank will not refund as they willingly sent the money. So cue me getting petty revenge. I found the listing and realized the scammer looked to be using their real account. So I took a screenshot of the profile which mentioned the place of work. Anyway, I messaged the seller and went through the whole ordeal and got their bank details. The details matched the name of the profile and the bank checker confirmed this too. Clearly the scammer was not the smartest cookie. So the following day, I called their place of work and asked to speak with them. When they answered, I asked about the tickets and whether they still had them. At this point, they hung up. I called back a couple more times and asked and they just hung up. I did what any good citizen would do when I emailed their HR department and copied them into the email too with screenshots of their Facebook and the conversations with both myself and my family member. The person worked for a bank, which was the ironic thing, and, well, HR emailed me to let me know they're investigating them for potential fraudulent activity. Here's to hoping they lose their job. I would love nothing more than for them to have had that bank account with this bank that they work for. Imagine being so stupid as to work for a bank, use your public Facebook account for scamming, and also have that bank account you scammed other people with and have the money in with said bank. This next story is, intentionally scalded my brother-in-law in the shower. 
Many years ago, my former partner's sister, her kids and her redneck lug of a husband came to stay with us. The husband was retired military, a big fat lug of a guy who grunted like some kind of gorilla, super macho and obnoxious. He would take every opportunity to get his point across that he was a real man, and us gay guys weren't. My partner made a nice breakfast for the whole group one morning, and then set up a tub in the sink so everyone could quickly wash their own dishes no dishwasher. When the brother-in-law was finished eating, he carried his plate into the kitchen, tossed it onto the counter and sneered, I ain't washing my own dish, then walked out. A few minutes later, he went to take a shower while everyone else, except me, went outside. It was an old apartment with bad plumbing, so while he was in the shower, I stood in the kitchen and turned the hot and cold water on and off throughout his entire shower. I could hear him in there yelping like a little girl as he alternately got hit by scalding hot and then freezing water. When he finished and came out of the bathroom, he said, wow, that shower temperature of yours is really crazy. I just smiled and said, oh, yeah, sometimes it's like that. Not the brightest if they couldn't figure out that there was some kind of manipulation going on. I mean, what realistically would cause that besides somebody manipulating things? You either have the world's worst shower cartridge that somehow spins around like it has a mind of its own, your water heater is exploding, or very clearly somebody is using the water somewhere else and manipulating it. Our next story is Slacker Med Student Exposed. Not me, but my boyfriend. When we were medical students, we had to do rotations in surgery. We were assigned teams of two students and once a week would be on call all night long followed by a full workload the next day. It was brutal, but having a partner helped some. My boyfriend unfortunately got stuck with a partner who was irresponsible. She wasn't very helpful on calls and was a slacker even when she wasn't on call. One on-call night, she never showed up. No call, no text, nothing. My boyfriend texted me asking what he should do as he had her phone number and could have texted her to ask where she was. But the night was young and he decided to just wait for her to show up, assuming she was running late, or had unforeseen circumstances. He was expecting her to eventually show up or contact him with a flimsy excuse, but it never happened. Instead, he ended up doing double duties all night because he had no partner. In the morning, my boyfriend asked me what he should do. I told him that instead of texting his partner to ask why she didn't show up, he should go directly to the secretary in the surgical office who coordinated students. If a student was sick or had an emergency situation, they were supposed to contact the secretary. So he went to the secretary and expressed his concern that his on-call partner had not shown up and had not contacted him to say why. He asked the secretary if the student had contacted her instead, but she had not. The surgeon who was in charge of the students heard from the secretary that the girl was AWOL the prior night. And he was livid. He chewed her out in front of everyone until she cried. Her friends, also medical students, complained to my boyfriend that he should have reached out directly to the student instead, but if she didn't have the decency to send him even a text message, she didn't deserve anything better. Could OP have reached out to them directly? Sure. Was it OP's responsibility? Not in any way. Was it her responsibility to show up or give a heads up? Yes. So don't flip this around and make OP out to be the bad guy because they're just trying to do their job. Our next story is Petty Revenge for a Chocolate Eating Husband Years ago, my husband ate my chocolate bar. It was super annoying because we both had one, but I was saving mine for a rainy day and didn't realize until I went looking for it. I told him I was going to do something to annoy him as revenge for his gluttony, but he would never know what it was or that I was responsible for it. Three months later, I hid his work ID card for a few days and gleefully watched him tip the house upside down looking for it. The best part is that all this time later, he still wants to know how I got my revenge, but I will never tell. You gotta love when it's an oblivious enough revenge that you're satisfied and you got your revenge, but again, they never know. Very sneaky. This next story is, accidentally, but not, made this lady think she smelled like dead fish. I did something really petty this morning and I feel a bit bad about it. For context, I have an INFJ personality type and I'm the kind of person who avoids confrontation and conflict at all costs, while also quite passive aggressive at times, something I'm working on with my therapist. 
I'm also kind of a pushover because I don't love dealing with drama, but most of the time I'm indifferent or don't care about anything. However, there are a handful of things that really irk me. So, I am of the belief that there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who wait for passengers to get off the metro before boarding it, and those who don't. Similarly, there are those people who return shopping carts, and heathens who don't. Same thing in my mind. I always wait for everyone to get off. Even if it means I have to sacrifice a seat or standing room, it's just, you know, good transpo etiquette and what people with souls should do. On the other hand, there are some people who will shove, elbow, or push their way onto a metro through rows of people trying to deboard. That is something that really freaking upsets me. I don't know why I care so much about something that has so little to no impact on me and I know it's so trivial, but it just really bothers me. As I waited next to the door for the last few people to get off the train this morning, this lady, shover lady, comes out of nowhere and bolts up the metro steps so she can get a seat, pushing into and elbowing people trying to get off the train. At that very moment, a switch flipped in me and I became enraged. You could literally call me a stupid bench or run me over with your car and I'd care less than I do about someone trying to get onto a train while others are trying to deboard. I get up the train steps and there are no seats. Fine, it's not crowded at all, so I don't mind, and Shover Lady didn't get a seat either, so I felt the scales of justice were balanced. She let out a sigh, leaned against a pole, and starts rolling around her ankle like she's stretching it in her three-inch stilettos and nice butt suit, both of which I actually really liked. I give credit where credit was due. Two stops later, the person sitting in front of me gets their stuff together to get off the train. I could tell Shover Lady was eyeing the seat, but I pretended to not pay attention or notice the person getting up. The moment passenger stood up, I see Shover Lady grab her bag off the floor to try to finagle her way around people deboarding. But the person getting off stepped in front of her, so I casually slid into the seat, not looking up for my phone once. Ha! Take that! At the next stop, an old wobbly lady with a cane hobbles on the train and of course, no one moves nor offers theirs to her. So I did what any normal-ish person with, oh, I don't know, a sliver of a soul would do, and stood up to give her my seat. Just as I was about to tap the old lady on the shoulder, Shover Lady shoves her way past me and into the seat. Now I'm furious. Not only had she taken my seat, but even worse, she took it from an old lady. At this point, I'm still pretending not to notice Shover Lady, and it's only me and the old lady standing, with the old lady standing like 10 feet away. You know how you can kind of just tell when someone is looking at your phone screen? Well, Shover Lady was looking at mine while I stood next to her. I was watching some show about 15th century Florence. Not super interesting, and she had her own phone, so I thought the fact that she kept looking at mine was mega weird, and that began to bother me even more. While I was sitting, she would hover over me for a few seconds, then look at her phone. So now, Shover Lady was sitting to my right, and I was leaning with my back against the wall of the vestibule. This is where I'm a little ashamed of my pettiness. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see her kind of eyeing my phone again. So I pulled up my eye messages and texted my sister, Dude, there's this lady on the train wearing the cutest stilettos, but I swear to God, she smells like dead fish. I'm moving to a different car at the next stop because I can't stand here for the rest of this ride. It's really bad. I was getting off at the next stop anyway, but wanted to extra freak with her. As we pulled up to my stop, I pretended to fumble around in my bag and accidentally dropped my phone on the floor right in her line of sight. I kept digging in my bag for a second to give her a chance to read the text, then grabbed my phone from the floor. As I began to walk away, I briefly glanced at the metro map above her, but actually at her kind of, and saw the shover lady's face had become beet red, like red red. Then I saw her slowly cross her legs and put her bag on her lap, and I walked off the train. What OP did here was pretty darn good, but I also had this kind of idea pop into my head where when the shover lady shoved past OP and took the seat, I was hoping OP would like ignore them, act like they didn't even realize they moved past them and took the seat, and continue talking to the old lady, maybe get a little bit louder and say, here ma'am, you can take my seat, I just got up for you. And then you turn around and you notice the lady there, and you go, oh, 
Never mind, as soon as I stood up, I guess this lady sat down and took it. Sorry, ma'am, you're gonna just have to keep standing up. You know, make a nice little scene of it for all of the captive audience and really shame this lady for being so greedy. Our next story is, you're mad at me over your gambling problem? Background, about 25 years ago, I registered my last name.com for my personal use. I mostly use it as an email server for my family. Unfortunately, there are many businesses around the world that use my last name dot their country code for their websites and email. As such, I regularly get business emails sent to my server. Most of the time, this just bounces, but sometimes they happen to match the name of a user or former user of my mail server. As all of the companies have been polite so far, I routinely forward business-related email to the correct addresses, because it doesn't really cost me anything. I've set up personal email addresses for some people I don't actually know who happen to have my last name, as long as they agree to not use it for spam. 20 years ago, there was this one guy who happened to have the same first name as my deceased uncle. I was monitoring that address, just in case anything important legally or financially came through, to make sure that his family doesn't get surprised by anything. The guy who decided to use that for his address had a serious gambling problem. I was getting emails from several gambling sites, often multiple times per day, with transaction records for large, at least from my perspective, deposits. These were all credit card transactions, very often for offshore online casinos, so they didn't exactly abide by banking regulations, either in the USA or his home country. In other words, I often got the full credit card numbers and expiration dates emailed unencrypted. If I had been dishonest, I could have easily run up thousands of dollars in charges. Because some of these transactions also had his physical address, I did have a way to contact him. First, by using that, I was able to figure out what his actual personal email address was. I didn't want to use his company email because of the nature of what I was sending. So I emailed him and explained the problem, and asked him if he was really comfortable with me having access to several of his credit cards. He accused me of being a hacker, called me several names that I shouldn't repeat here, and blew me off because I kept getting the email receipts. At this point I figured out that he was probably digging himself and his family into a fairly deep financial hole, and while I was annoyed with him for ignoring his problem and being rude, I didn't think that his family should pay the price for his bad gambling habit. Because I had his home address, I was able to figure out his wife's name and where she worked. I printed up a stack of about 20 of the emails, put them into an envelope marked personal and confidential, and dropped them in the mail to her office. A couple of weeks later, the gambling email stopped. A few months after that, out of curiosity, I did a search for them again and found the legal notice for their divorce. Oops. I mean, it's probably OP interfering a little too much into their private lives, but I get it. Gambling destroys lives. I mean, hey, maybe this was overall a productive thing they did for somebody else. Our next story is, add me to your religious distribution list. Enjoy donating to pro-choice charities. Once upon a time, I was religious. The church is militantly pro-life. I was, and still am, pro-choice. My pro-choiceness overcame the church's inculcation and I left the church and religion in general. A few years ago, a religious fraternal group from my old church decided to add me to their email distribution list. I suspect they thought the email address belonged to my father, who was a former member. He's now a militant atheist, go figure. Every few days for years, I've received emails from the group, including for pro-life events. I finally got tired of the emails and figured I could procure some revenge. After receiving the last straw email, I created an anonymized email address. Then, I donated to an abortion charity on the group's behalf and took a screenshot, which I scrubbed of metadata. From the new email address, I informed them that they had added me to the group's distribution list. I noted that I was pro-choice and that because of the last email they sent, I donated to a pro-choice charity on their behalf. Then comes the kicker. I told them for each email I received from them, I would donate to that charity again. Note that they do not know who I am. That leaves them with three choices. First, they can continue to send emails and as a result, precipitate donations to pro-choice charities. Second, they spend hours piecing through their distribution list to try to figure out who I am. 
Third, they can recreate their entire large mailing list, which took years of work from scratch. I'm happy with any of those outcomes. I'd almost be willing to bet that they're not even going to care and that they'll just keep sending it. Maybe after OP donates four or five times, maybe then they'll do something about it? But hey, even if it forces OP's hand, at the end of the day, they're supporting a cause they believe in, right? Our next story is mother-in-law revenge. So my mother-in-law was always being really horrible to me. She once canceled my baby shower without telling me because I wouldn't agree to give her the money for my unborn child's account to pay for the food, which by the way she insisted on making. I told her I would pay and have the party catered. No big deal, but she got angry. This was a constant occurrence. She was always calling her family members to talk bad about me, and so they started to treat me differently as well. What my mother-in-law didn't tell everyone was that not only was her phone in my name, but I paid the bill. So I got tired of the crap, went online and changed her phone name to mine. Now whenever she calls someone, it comes up as me. She was annoyed and was complaining to me how nobody was picking up her calls. It took her forever to realize, and I was silently jumping for joy whenever she complained. Honestly, I'm impressed that anybody even seems to have caller ID working anymore. I mean, we all have contact names. I'm surprised that these people didn't just still have something pop up as Karen because they had that number inputted as a contact. It just seems to me nowadays, though, that like nobody has caller ID anymore except for like really official companies. This next story is sign me up for your crypto junk mail reported to your boss's boss. A company I worked for asked me to substitute for another teacher. Let's call him Fred. Instead of leaving the textbook with the students and emailing me the details, Fred insisted that we meet in person to hand over the textbook and give me details of the class. Apparently leaving the textbook with the students after the lesson is fine, but I have to meet him to pick it up? Kind of a waste of time, but okay. When I meet Fred, he spends more time trying to sell me on cryptocurrency than discussing the class. He hardly spent any time on the latter. As soon as I figure out that that was his reason for meeting in person, I check out. This must have been palpable because he snaps at me for not paying attention, and that this is a huge opportunity for me. I was pretty ticked at having my time wasted, and for the sake of trying to sell me something I have negative interest in, but it gets worse. He must have signed me up for a newsletter because he immediately starts sending me mass emails promoting whatever crypto trash he's trying to sell. I didn't give him my email, he must have gotten it from the company. On getting the first one, I replied to him in no uncertain terms that this email account is strictly for work. I absolutely do not sign up for anything with it specifically to keep it spam free. His response is, oops, no apology, no remorse, and he still didn't remove me from his freaking mailing list, so even though we ostensibly need to maintain email contact so I can let him know how the class went, etc., I blocked him. Q petty revenge. I contact my boss and let them know all of this. They expressed shock and sympathy and forwarded it to their boss, who in a work email called him a jerk. From what I understand, he is no longer with the company. Honestly, I'd almost say OP took too long in reporting this kind of behavior. As soon as this guy had you come into what, school grounds to try to sell you on their crypto side hustle? And it was very apparent that was the whole reason they wanted you to come in? Maybe you should have reported it then and there. Our next story is revenge against the Airbnb's leaf blowing with precision chainsawing. Next door is a purpose-built Airbnb cottage. It's very nice, very expensive, and super annoying. Every three days, there's some new renters who shout, make all sorts of late-night noise in the hot tub, and then the owner shows up to clean before the next louts arrives. While his wife does the real work, he uses a leaf blower. It's in the forest. There are leaves. Get over it. Anyway, the petty revenge. For every minute of leaf blowing, his next guest will hear an exact amount of time of chainsawing. If my neighbor has been super annoying or the previous guests super inconsiderate, the ratio goes to 1.5 times or even 2 times. It's important to me that there is a ratio. My question is, are they breaking any noise ordinances? Are they being unreasonably rude? Is it outlandish for somebody to be using this as an Airbnb? 
I mean, listen, I get it. OP wants to have their peaceful cottage out in the forest. But if you're out there wanting to have this peaceful tranquility, probably shouldn't be that close to another person who can be loud. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.